Okay, well, let's begin with the word of prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for this morning, and we just ask that um, you can be with each person and the struggles they face, uh, the health problems, and the difficulties that surround us each day. Help us to trust in you uh, for guidance and direction. We pray that you can be in this study this morning. May your Holy Spirit um, guide and direct us in uh, the time we have together. Help us to understand your word and um, to see clearly the things that are in our path to guide our feet. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning, everyone. So Dwight's going to have to leave a little bit early, so we're going to... Uh, uh, let Dwight sort of take over this first part of the study. Because um, you have a few points that you wanted to uh, look at regarding the connection with Joseph and what we're seeing here in Judges. Can you elaborate on that a bit? Okay. <clears throat> what I was saying in the meeting yesterday we have as we as we're looking at this in judges five and we when we looked at the diagram that you'd put up yesterday <clears throat> we were looking at the situation going through to trump and biden okay now we were comparing trump with Xerxes, according to this. Right. Because Xerxes was to be the king that was to be the, quote, far richer, richer than they all, right? Yep. Now, if this was to, to track with what we know of history, then Biden would be the equivalent of Artabanus. Right, so th this placeholder. This placeholder. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the history dealing with Artabanus, it is very likely that he was like a, um, a type of upper level official that may have killed Xerxes. Yeah. There's uncertainty regarding that. So one is there's a lot of dependence on Herodotus. Right. He's not really very reliable. Um, so, you know, he makes up stuff. So we don't know exactly what happened there. But we do know there's an Artabanus in between. Uh, just how much he, what power he had or so forth isn't really known. Right. But he was over the Persian Empire for less than, not, not even two months, maybe just one month. Yeah, just a very short period of time, yeah. Okay. Now, my question having to deal with Joseph, we know that Joseph came out of prison and was raised up to be second only to Pharaoh in Egypt. Okay. This occurred when Joseph was 30 years old. Right. Yeah, he sold into slavery when he's 17. And when he's 30, he stands before Pharaoh. Two years after the dream of the butler and the baker. Okay. So the dream of the, of the butler and the baker took place when he was 28. Yeah. He stands before Pharaoh at 30. By the time that he is 37, the seven good years have expired. But Joseph and his wife now have two sons. Right, Manasseh and Ephraim. Okay. Now, in the next two years, his brothers return twice to Egypt for food. Yeah. But we also have the situation, as, as we were looking at this, that 
Joseph, in that two-year period, gathers up all the money that was found in Egypt and in the land of Canaan. So he takes complete control of the economy. Yeah. And when the money failed in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan, all, all of the Egyptians came unto Joseph and said, <clears throat> give us bread, or why should we die in thy presence? The money faileth. Yeah. And Joseph makes an exchange. Mm -hmm. The money fails, and he says, give me your cattle. Okay. What do we see as a symbol from the cattle? Um, I don't know. Okay, <clears throat> to ask the question in this way. What would the cattle represent in the modern day? All the means by which we can earn a living. I would have to think that to be correct. Okay. So. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. He said she was saying that the cattle represents a mean by which we earn a living. Okay. So <clears throat> the economy fails. Joseph gathers up all the money. The people are saying we're starving. We're going to surrender our ability to make money. We're going to surrender our way of making a living. So you have step one, the money fails. Step two, the people come to Joseph for food to eat and they exchange their method, their ability to make a living for food. Mm -hmm. So in this, they brought their cattle unto Joseph and Joseph gave them bread in exchange for horses, for the flocks and for the cattle of the herds and for the asses. And he fed them with bread for all their cattle for that year. So if this is the event after this is at the close of the first year of the of the bad year of the bad seven. Yeah, so it's well, it's definitely connected. Um, so okay, so when you have a famine, I mean, you're going to have a year in which you're going to have you're not you're not going to have food, and they're going to buy food. So it has to be the second year, wouldn't it be that? No, it's the know? close of the first. Okay. Because they don't know how long the famine's going to be. Joseph has already predicted it to be seven, seven bad years. That's why he collected all yeah. of the grain. But I'm saying the people don't necessarily believe that, do they? You may have a point. Yeah. Yeah, because they, they would have to be in dire straits before they'd give up their cattle. Well, I, I don't know. They maybe they do believe it. it. You know, it's possible. I don't know. What we know here is that this has occurred after the end of the seven good years. Yeah. So you know, maybe the seven years of plenty, but you know, if they had known about it, wouldn't they store things themselves and prepare for the seven years of famine? You know, I don't know how to approach that question. Yeah. yeah. Now it says in verse 18, and this is my support for this being at the end of the first year. Okay. 47, 18. 
And when that year was ended, they came unto him the second year. Oh, okay. So you're probably correct there then. And said unto him, we will not hide it from my Lord, how that our money is spent. My Lord also hath our herds of cattle. There is not any or aught left in the sight of my Lord, but our bodies and our lands. Yeah, so they sell, sell themselves in the second year and their well, land. They sell themselves and their land. That's the point. Right, yeah. Okay, that's correct. That's right. That's what happens. So here is Joseph. On one side, sometime in that first year, he's dealing with his brothers, but he's also dealing with the people. Now, his brothers return that second year, and the people return that second year. Okay, this is where I don't know if that's what happened. So, I mean, it is possible. I, I always thought it was in the same year. So, so, so they sh sh show up the first time, but he doesn't reveal himself to the brothers. Correct. Or, but, but they bow before him. Because they think he's a ruler, and they're supposed to be 22 years. Uh, I'm pretty sure Ellen White puts 22 years before that event, between um, when when he had his two dreams and his brothers bow before him. But um, but yeah, I mean, it sort of makes sense that it would be one year and then two years. But I don't know. Anyway, go on. You, you could be correct. So, <clears throat> wherefore shall we die before thine eyes, both we and our land? Buy us and our land for bread, and we and our land will be servants unto Pharaoh, and give us seed that we may live and not die, that the land may not be desolate. And Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh, for the Egyptians sold every man his field, because the famine prevailed over them, so the land became Pharaoh's. Then we have the verse that says, and for the people, he removed them to the cities from one end of the borders of Egypt, even to the other end thereof. Now, only the land of the priests bought he not, for the priests had a portion assigned them of Pharaoh, and did eat their portion, which Pharaoh gave them, wherefore they sold not their lands. Now, of course, these are Egyptian priests. Correct. Then Joseph said unto the people, Behold, I have bought you this day, and your land for Pharaoh. Lo, here is seed for you, and ye shall sow the land. And it shall come to pass in the increase that ye shall give the fifth part, 20%, mm. unto Pharaoh. And four parts shall be your own, for seed of the field, and for your food, and for them of your households, and for food for your little ones. So of the seed, 20% was to be returned to Pharaoh. 80% was to remain in their hands. Yeah. Now, the situation that, that I was seeing and I was asking about here is we have specific events on this line with Joseph. Yeah. We know that the situation with Joseph is a type of a representation of a Sunday law. Mm -hmm. Can the events that are seen here be then applied in such a way that point to different events that would happen upon the big line? of the Sunday law. 
Okay, explain further. We know that in order for this to occur with the Sunday law, that some group is going to take complete control of what's going on. Right, and Egypt represents the world. Correct. But it's going to be largely an economic control mm -hmm. that at least here is being represented. Yeah. So is it possible that this with the Sunday law is going to be a type of an economic control that's going to come in? It's going to be pushed upon the world. Well, I mean, that's kind of what we see happening. So I'd have to say, yeah, I mean, that's and that's what we've already understood. Okay. Um, hmm. So when, when we look at the story of Joseph, we know that the story of Joseph we've paralleled with Samuel Snow. Right. And that it represents this movement in some way, on some level. Um, so so we have different stories in the bible and they have different aspects that is one thing we've never looked at it when it comes to a line or we haven't addressed completely so when we look at a line there's a period of darkness and then you have an increase of light and then it addresses that specific darkness right now but when you also have a story um, a story can only illustrate one aspect of of a line or of, of of maybe not of a line but one aspect of um, a particular truth one facet of the overall picture and in the story of joseph uh, we see egypt in the in the story of the decrees we see uh persia right right um in uh so in different stories, we can see different aspects or different kingdoms, or different principles that are being addressed. And, and in the story of Joseph, it, it's primarily about the Sunday law. That is, it's a zoom into something uh, like this movement is or a repeat of history. But it's addressing Egypt itself. And so maybe there's just certain details that it's bringing out that we would look at that apply to our line um, well I, I guess the point that i'm having to look at here is joseph now we have addressed in the past that joseph is a representation of a type of christ right yeah if he is a representation of a type of christ does that also not mean that he is a representation of the 144,000? Well, yeah, because they're, they're typified by Christ too. Therefore, when his brothers and his family come to Egypt for the corn, for the food, Doesn't Joseph's family represent those that would be benefited from the message of the 144,000? Yeah, well, they would have to.
Now, in this situation, elements of this story still have symbols, just as you were saying, of different items that we've looked at upon the big line and upon some of the other lines. Mm -hmm. It doesn't quite have the detail that we're looking at with the Persians, with Xerxes, Darius, and the rest. But they do have elements. Joseph's time in prison could easily represent a time of darkness. Um, yeah, I don't know if I would do that with his time in prison, but I mean, you could create other lines within Joseph's line. Joseph's line is the fourth, right? Because you have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as being the first, second, and third angel's message. So Joseph's line is a repeat of history. And but you can't you could create different lines within it because you can zoom into a way mark. Um, but, I, you know, in Joseph's line, it's primarily the second angel's message, just as our line is. That's the focus of our line since 9-11, at least. So. I don't know, does that make sense? Well, I'm, I'm listening. Yeah, it's just, uh, you know, we haven't really defined how we look at Joseph's line. I mean, we have the prediction before midnight. We have the, the dream of the butler and the baker in the three days. And that means you would have to mark um, that as July 18th as a symbol. And then he's going to have uh, this dream fulfilled, or the butler and the baker's dream fulfilled three days later. But it's still going to be two years before he stands before Pharaoh. And then we would have to say, well, what, what is happening here? How do we place the years of plenty and famine? Where, I mean, we normally have placed the Sunday law in connection with the famine. So. Technically, technically, I mean, while we recognize that there's two years before Joseph stands before Pharaoh. Yeah. If we were using a an ordinal count. Would there not be three years before Joseph stands before Pharaoh? Well, since it's from birthday to birthday, um, I mean, you could, I guess, count that's the first year, then there's the second year, which would be the birthday to next year, and then the third year. I guess you could. But it, sort of, it stands in the Bible as two years, not as three years. I, I'm aware of what you're saying because that's the way scripture is written. The The point that you've been making throughout is that we need to be aware of both ordinal and cardinal counts. Yeah. But I think there's a reason why it's two years is what I'm trying to say. Because in the story of Joseph, it's about the second angel's message. And even from the time of, of you know, dealing with Jacob, which is... Um, you know, because Isaac's going to have twins, right? You have a lot of stories that are doubled, even if they have differences. But here you have the two dreams. Um, you have the two dreams of the butler and the baker. Um, you have the, the two years. I mean, there's a whole bunch of doublings of things, the two periods of seven years. Uh, the two years again that are going to be mentioned in connection with uh, how long the famine has been with the five years remaining. So if you were going to say it's three years, why would you want it to be three years, the third year? What symbol is attached to it? All I'm trying, all I'm trying to do is to look at this in the manner that we have been considering other points. Okay. I don't have a direct answer there yet. Okay. Yeah, I just think as a symbol, it's powerful as two. And I wouldn't see a reason to, to make it the third year. In that we have the three days, that's the symbol of the prediction before midnight. 
And so we need to know why it's mentioned as two and what two means. Um, I understand your your point that we could make it the third year, but the Bible doesn't do that there because I think the symbol of two is more powerful. Um, so you're going to have to go. When are you leaving here? I'll be leaving. I, I'm going to have to start getting ready now, but I'll be. I'm going to look to leave just at about 7.30. Okay. Okay, so um, my other computer is not connecting to the internet at all, so I have no idea why. I can't bring up the things that I wanted to bring up. Um, Aran, could you possibly share the picture that that uh, Stephen had shared on WhatsApp? Sure. So if you can share that on the screen and uh, Yeah, because I don't know why the one computer cannot connect and the other one can. It's the same same internet. <clears throat> what? So, um, oh, yeah. Okay. So a couple of things showed up in the WhatsApp uh, this morning um, that I want to point to, and and I want to address what. Uh, uh, what we had discussed yesterday regarding the donkey and the elephant, the symbols of republicanism. So, um, so I'll start with uh, uh, somebody had shared from Prophetic Faith of Our Fathers um, the short biography that he has on Samuel Snow. It's just you know a paragraph biography, and they had accidentally, however that happens, whether it's in the book uh, itself or when they scanned it. It has Samuel Snow uh, passing away in 1870, but we know that he passed away in 1890. So, so it is possible when they scanned it, uh, you know, the, the the copy of the book that they had uh, had a, a unclear type, and and it just scanned it as a seven, and nobody ever went to correct it. But I thought it was interesting because he's born in 1806. And, you know, we, we know he dies in 1890, but they had 1870. So 1806, that's 186, if we take the, eliminate the zero, which we know is the number of cardinal days from the first day of the first month to the 10th day of the seventh month. So it represents July 18th. And, and we have that 186 years uh, count from the first day of the first month in 1844 to April 5th, 2030, uh, which also happens to be 187 prophetic years plus 20 prophetic months. And the fact that these line up to the day is, is pretty amazing. Um, and then, so that means we have there in that biography and prophetic faith of our fathers on the E.G. White Estates and on the E.G. White Disc, it says the same thing. Um, we then have these symbols of 186 and 187 in connection with Samuel Snow. So we had looked at this donkey, um, the first time that is used as a symbol for, symbol for the Democrats. It's uh, Thomas Nast, who's writing in the Harper's uh, Weekly. Um, and he has a cartoon of a donkey kicking a dead lion. And that is in 1870. But the first time an elephant was used was in uh, 1860 for the Republican Party. And that is in connection with Abraham Lincoln. So again, we have the 186 and 187 symbols connected with this donkey and this elephant. But one thing, de detail that I didn't notice, but maybe someone else noticed it, is um, we have in... Uh, uh, in this the cartoon kicking a dead lion so in steven's line as you can see here he's having trump lined up with xerxes and judah so what's the symbol for judah somebody lion of course yeah so it's a lion and and would that means trump would be symbolized by a lion here 
And is Trump a dead lion with Biden or the Democrats? Are the Democrats kicking at Trump right now? They have for the last four years. <laughs> yeah. But now he's he would we'd have to call him a dead lion, though, at this point. Correct. Right. So so I thought it was very interesting, very apt that he he chose this dead lion. Uh, now, in this case, he's not having the dead lion represent uh, Trump or or or, you know, the Republicans. It has to do with some I can't remember the person's name. Sutton, I think, if I remember correctly, I just can't see it right now. My computer. Won't uh, I think it's I think it's Stanton. The Secretary Stanton. of War. Yeah. yeah, yeah, Stanton, Secretary of War. There you go. So, um, so I think that's it's rather interesting that we have these symbols showing up in these years, 1870 and 1860, and that we have the 1806 and the 1870 date connected together. Now. Um, so in dealing with this, this aspect of Issachar, you know, we have, as we went through the diagram yesterday, um, and I'm really frustrated with my computer. But anyway, I feel handicapped when I can't use both computers because I'm recording on this one. I don't know what happens if I try using this one to look at things while I'm recording on it. I, I, don't, I think it would affect the recording, but I don't know. I've never tried it. Um, so here, just hang on a second. I'm going to go grab another computer. It's just my other laptop. Now, what other things can we see here regarding um, this idea of the Democrats being this donkey? So what were the other things we discussed? Well, if, the, if this is indeed the case, then, of course, the Democrats would be represented, representational of Issachar. Okay, right. And Issachar is... Well, as, as a tribe, they're represented by the donkey, especially a donkey that collapses between two burdens. Right. So, so we can see that, um, so we have this, this symbol for Issachar being the donkey, so that's another witness to this being the Democrats, right, that they're connected with this symbol. But also we have Islam connected with that as well. Right. And then, of course, we have this span of time, the 64,300 days from the Great Disappointment to Joe Biden, uh, Biden being announced as the winner of the election. Now, now we had the election, uh, of course, on the 3rd. So this is, is four days later that we have this uh, this occur. So so we needed this delay in this this announcement, just like we had with Trump. He wasn't announced until the day after on the 9th, even though the election was on the 8th. Um, now, the fact this also lines up with Jeff's birthday, what's the significance of that? Well, when we're looking at this with Jeff's birthday, we're looking at September, or excuse me, November 7th. Mm -hmm. So, it, it's just, it's intriguing that his birthday there would line up with the day that Biden is, is announced as winner of the, of the presidential race. 
Okay, now we have 69 years. Right. So what's 69 years? Twenty three times three. Okay, that's correct. Okay, so Rand says Jeff gives the midnight cry in a sense. Okay, I need to know what he means by in a sense, because I think he does within a certain part of the line. But sixty nine isn't there sixty nine weeks and then the seventieth week? Correct. Yeah. Okay. So he is a parallel, yes. Um, so so we have that symbol there dealing with the, the 69 and then the 70. So what's the difference between the 69 and the 70? Why, why do we have 69 weeks, which is, of course, 62 or, or seven weeks and 62 weeks together? But, but why do we have 69? If we tie this back into the 2300 days, which is is the symbol that I was looking at with 23 times three, we're looking at a situation that here is, here is the time of the um, word to go out to the, um, well, technically first for the Jews, but now to the to those that would would come into this with the movement at the very end. Because it's a symbol leading up to the week of Christ, the week of his ministry to the end of the world. Okay. So the week of Christ uh, is going to be a chiastic structure. Can have the cross in the center, the Sunday law. And it, and it starts with the baptism of Christ. Right. Now. So is it is it possible that we have a type of baptism yet to address? Well, this movement, maybe. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, that's, I think, what we would have to look at. Okay. Um, now, what about this number 64,300? So we haven't really addressed that number, per se, other than to put it on a line. I haven't looked at that very much. Okay, so it's 178 years in prophetic years. Right, so that is if we take this number and we divide it by 360, we get 178. And 178 is a symbol of July 18th. And then it's 220 days extra. So 178 years and 220 days. So would that be significant? Can we tie that symbol? Well, the 220, of course, should be significant to all of us. Yeah, and the 178 too, because we remember from um, in, in a, 60, a 365 day year, if you have 187 and you subtract that from 365, you get 178, right? So it's the remainder after you take from the first day of the first month to the 10th day of the seventh month, you subtract that from 365, right? So,
Okay, so so that's the significance there. It ties the the symbol of July eighteenth to uh, together with with the full a uh, period of a uh, hundred and sixty five three hundred and sixty five days. So we have two symbols. We have a July eighteenth symbol, and then we have a two hundred and twenty day symbol. So. I mean, if we went 220 days back from November 20th, uh, 2020, I haven't looked at that yet because um, I'm handicapped here at the moment without the one computer. Um, so, so if we go to, um, so what, what that would be, it'd still be in the year 2020. Um, so I'd probably be back here. I'm just doing this on the other computer. And then I have to go here. Oh, Rand could probably do this faster than me. So that's going to bring us to, um, April 1st, or April 1st, 2020. Well, that'd be kind of apt. Something interesting. <laughs> OK. Uh, yeah. 64,300. Six, yeah. You just have the number 643. Yeah. It's, it is the 117th crime number. Okay. So do you have do you have, you have November the seventh and that number six four three? Okay. Very interesting. So so when we just look at a number, so we're not taking the sixty four thousand three hundred, we're just taking the six four three. And and we do this, we just look at it as a number because we take away the zeros. But it's the eleven one hundred and seventeenth prime number and and of course, 11 7 is the symbol for November 7th. So, so that's pretty interesting. Did you figure that out earlier or just now? No, just that and I. Okay. Um, now, when, when did you show up, Stephen? Because I can't see when anybody, when they show up or anything like that. Okay, I can end about 15 minutes late. What's that? I've been listening for maybe about half an hour. Okay, so you've been here for so with that discussion regarding uh, uh, Judah being the lion and the donkey kicking the lion in uh, Nast's Nast, uh, cartoon. Did you have any thoughts on that? Um, to me. It or sort of connects with that lion and the donkey theme that we have in 977 BC. Yes. Although that, okay. yeah. yeah. So, so, so looking at 977, so we know that we have uh, the disobedient prophet, right? As, which is how we have labeled him in that he was supposed to return. Um, was it the same way he came? Or was it a different way? I can't remember how that went. Oh, a different way. A different way. Um, and he wasn't supposed to stop anywhere, right? But he gets called in um, by this other prophet uh, to stay with him. And, and then how does it go? Can somebody just recount the story? So he's going to go see Josiah, or not Josiah, um, uh, Jeroboam, and he's going to give the prophecy of Josiah. And then he's going to yeah. get sidetracked. Yeah, so uh, Jeroboam, he invites him to stay. Right. But he's, he's going to give him food and riches or whatever. But he says, no, I'm just to go on. And he does go on. Yeah. But then he stops by like a palm tree or something, or like a note, I can't remember. Yeah. And then this year, other prophet approaches him and says, Lord, God's told me something different. You know that you're the 
eight with me or whatever, I can't remember exactly. Yeah. But eventually he does eat with him. And then when he's after the meal or whatever, the prophet then announces that uh, you're disobedient and you shouldn't have listened to me, basically. Yeah. Okay. And then who is he go where what is this uh that's gonna happen? Who's gonna die? Yeah, so he leaves that house and then uh, a lion meets him on the way. So he's, I think he's on a donkey. So that's a lion attacks him, but it leaves the donkey alone. Okay. So that's... the lion's alive. It's not a dead lion. Okay, the lion's <laughs> alive. Okay, so yeah, so I'm trying to remember how that happens. So there's is is the donkey dead or what? What's happening? I I, I can't see anything right now. So it's an oh, the donkey's open, alive. First Kings, First Kings chapter thirteen. So I'm just trying to get my other computer working. Um, it says the uh, ass stood by the lion. Stood by the carcass, and the lion also stood by the carcass. Okay, so yeah, so I'm gonna go there here. I just so if the lion is Judah, yeah, could that represent Donald Trump? Yeah, that's what I'm trying to figure out how we would look at that story now. Okay, so this story gives me, as Jeff would say, heartburn because it looks like the Lord sent a decoy to deceive him or an inf infiltrator, some trickster. Why, Lord, did you allow this to happen? <laughs> yeah, now who would be the, the trickster here? The, well, who's, who's the deceptive prophet? Fauci, people like him? No, no. pharmaceutical company? No, yes, yes. Not no, not in this context. You don't think so? No. Enlighten us, Theodore. Okay. Well, wouldn't this have to do with this movement? Oh, well, then it would be Parminder and Kess and people like that. And our own hearts. I mean, our own hearts are so deceptive too. I mean, I got carried away by some of their garbage. Yeah. Yeah, so so I would think that that's how we would, because I've struggled with this story uh, for quite a while in this movement, trying to figure out what this is. Um, and you think I'd know it better. But as we learn more, you know, more details uh, really come out. So now there dwelt an old prophet in Bethel. So I'm going to uh, do this. So now I can share another screen. So, so you can take that down there if you want to run. And I think I can do this now. Well, what's this doing here? It is. Yeah, it's just hard when I can't share a screen. So we got, here's the Bible. <clears throat> So now there dwelt an old prophet in Bethel. So the significance of Bethel, we know that this is the house of God, right? Agreed. Mm -hmm. Okay. And his sons came and told him all the works that the man of God had done in that, that day in Bethel. And the words which he had spoken unto the king, them told, they told also to their father. And their father said unto them, What way went he? For his sons had seen what way the man of God went, which came from Judah. And he said unto his sons, Saddle me the ass. So they saddled him the ass, and he rode thereon, and went after the man of God, and found him sitting under an oak. Now, uh, this oak tree, what would this be? What is this oak tree? Why is he under an oak? I know the oak tree is like strength. It's it spreads out. It's a huge tree and very very strong. But but in witchcraft, an oak tree 
means a lot to them. I read up on that once. I don't recall it all, but oh, they yeah. worship like the Druid, for example. I mean, I'm of the Druid line, but I really haven't studied that deeply into it. Okay, well, I'm more concerned about I what think the Druid means, means oak, and, actually. So, because we have this um, as a symbol in, in the Bible. So, uh, the word oak or a strong tree, an elm tree, a teal tree, um, a terebinth is is sometimes uh, what it's referred to, whatever that is particularly. So it says here from the same as 193, properly strength, hence anything strong, specifically a chief politically, also a ram from his strength, a plaster as a strong support, an oak or other other strong tree. Right. So we had, uh, yeah, we had looked at the oak uh, 2019. I think it's like a, it's like post farm is called beneath the oak or something like that. We have the post farm declaration. Okay, so with uh, with uh, yeah. declaration, yeah, the Potsdam. So Potsdam Declaration is connected to the oak. I think that's what, what Potsdam means. Oh, okay. So Potsdam means an oak. Okay, it's like between the oaks or beneath the oak. Okay, because we were connecting this somewhat with with Nashville, correct? Yes. We okay. can tie down Rachel Oaks as well. Yeah. So the Sabbath, the Sabbath coming in there, maybe with her. Okay. So can we say that this movement had been uh, sidetracked by by the Nashville uh, prediction? And so we're just examining this. Because, I mean, this was the accusation. This was, you know, we went off the path. Uh, you know, we made this prediction regarding Nashville, and that's because we were deceived. And, of course, the deceiver would be me in this case. And looks like my... Uh, my other computer's reconnecting. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so my laptop is disconnected. For some reason, this laptop keeps going, but the other ones are having trouble with the internet. Okay, so um, so what would this mean? Can we can we can we in some ways say that we were deceived, but we would have to figure in what way we were deceived? by the Nashville prediction. Because we have two different predictions that apparently failed, the Trump prediction and the Nashville prediction, right? How did Joseph's brothers view his uh, prediction regarding them bowing down to him? Um. Okay, what do, you, what do you mean? How did they predict? I mean, the sun, they the, sun the moon, and the stars would bow down to, and the sheaves would bow down to him. Right. Yeah. Well, the idea was, are we going to bow down to you? I mean, they just they just mocked it. Okay. So my question here is, since since we were very focused on the two years, yeah, is it possible? that this is two years ordinal or the three years cardinal. That, yeah, round, but anyway. Okay, so I've got it backwards. I apologize. Okay. Is it possible that this is another symbol that can be tied back into what we're talking about about July 18th? Well, yeah. Whoops. 
sorry about that. <laughs> um, I had the other audio uh, on there. So, okay, so I'm just going to share my screen again from here. Um, okay, can you explain that further? I know you got to leave pretty soon. Yeah, I got to get rolling now. Yeah, okay. Well, maybe we'll come back to that tomorrow. That's fine. Because cause I don't fully understand what, what it is you're getting at, so I can't elaborate on it. Okay, so here we have um, this, this, this um, deception that occurs. Can we, can we say that this movement was deceived? And then also, was this movement disobedient? Well, you have uh, Millerite history. Yeah. First disappointment was considered as a liar. If we're going to connect it to Holocaust, chapter two. Yeah. So, in the sense that it was like a, a deception that way. Okay. Um, because now I suppose it's going to happen, but there's just a tarrying to it. And there's a tarrying yeah. time, yeah. But was this movement disobedient in in some way? Does this movement um, have a disobedience? Because we have this disobedient prophet. I mean, he's going to get sidetracked by a message. And, and, and so we would have to look at, you know, who's proclaiming the prophecy of Josiah? And, and, and is the prophecy of Josiah July 18th? Well, that is connected. I believe. Yeah, <laughs> because it's the, pro the prophecy of Josiah is July 18th. I mean, without, without Ezekiel's prophecy, understanding, Je you know, Ezekiel's prophecy and the prophecy of Josiah, and, and its connection to the prophecy of Josiah Litch, which happened in 2016, without that understanding, uh, we don't have July 18th. So July 18th is wrought out of this, of the understanding of this structure, and also the story of Joseph. There's other things that connect as well, story of Ezra. But it, it's primarily this understanding of Josiah Litch's prophecy and the connection with the, the prophecy of Josiah, because we, we wouldn't have had that 391.5 on October 13th, even if I'd counted that it was 391 and a half days, it wouldn't have meant anything without the connection to Ezekiel. So we had all of this groundwork being laid, but now we have to say, so we, we gave a message, that message would have to be correct, right? Isn't the message that's being given on July 18th, if it's the prophecy of Josiah, is it fulfilled? Um, not to the it. We protect it. Well, well, the prophecy of Josiah is fulfilled for, for that time, right? I mean, Josiah is going to come and fulfill the prophecy as was predicted by this disobedient prophet. But Ezekiel, yeah, okay. right? So, but Ezekiel is going to pick this up, and he's going to use the the time from the giving of the prophecy to its fulfillment to start a period of three hundred ninety years and forty years, and then he's going to be predicting, of course, the siege but indirectly the destruction of Jerusalem in 586 and the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, specifically the temple being destroyed on the 10th day of the fifth month in both of those years. Um, so, so the prophecy of Josiah is correct. So if we look at this as dealing with our movement, our movement gives a correct prophecy, but then there's a disobedience that follows, right? That is, it's going to get sidetracked. And the question is, when does this occur, and how would we apply it?
see, I don't think that we could have understood this back in 2018 or 19 or even 2020. Maybe by the end of 2020, we could have understood it. But we can see that this disobedience has this connection. So let's let's read this again. Um, and uh, I'm just going to get rid of the, the numbers here. Let's do this here. Now there dwelt an old prophet in Bethel, and his sons came and told him all the works that the man of God had done that day in Bethel, the words which he had spoken unto the king, them that told they told, them they told also to their father, and their father said unto them, What way went he? For his sons had seen what way the man of God went, which came from Judah. And he said unto his sons, Saddle me an ass. So they saddled him the ass, and he rode thereon and went after the man of God and found him sitting under an oak and he said unto him art thou the man of God that camest from Judah and he said I am then he said unto him come home with me and eat bread so eating bread would represent what a message a message of some sort so some kind of study and he said, I may not return with thee, nor go in with thee, neither will I eat bread, nor drink water with thee in this place. For it was said to me by the word of the Lord, thou shalt eat no bread, nor drink water there, nor turn again to go by the way that thou camest. And he said unto him, I am a prophet also, as thou art. And an angel spake unto me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with thee into thine house, that he may eat bread and drink water but he lied unto him so he went back with him and he did eat bread in his house and drank water and it came to pass as they sat at the table that the word of the Lord came unto the prophet that brought him back and he cried unto the man of God that came from Judah saying thus saith the Lord for as much as thou hast disobeyed the mouth of the Lord and hast not kept the commandment which the Lord thy God commanded thee but camest back, and hast eaten bread, and drunk water in the place, of which the Lord did say to thee, Eat no bread, and drink no water. Thy carcass shall not come unto the sepulchre of thy fathers. And it came to pass, after he had eaten bread, and after he had drunk, that he saddled for him the ass, to wit, for the prophet whom he had brought back. Um, and when he was gone, a lion met him by the way and slew him, and the carcass was cast in the way, and the ass stood by it. The lion also stood by the carcass. So who is here that is killed? Anybody? The prophet. Okay, so the disobedient prophet is killed, correct? Yes. Okay. So has has the person that gave this message died? Has the movement, how do we apply this? Who is dead? And why? Uh, the core of FFA as we know it. Okay, so FFA is dead. Okay, so who was deceived? Now, remember, we, we in understanding judges, even though Parminder's brought out of the way in 2019, he's he gets his own movement. Has his teaching or his deception still infected the movement? Uh, yes. Yes, it has. Yes, it has. Yeah. So the December 6th declaration is just a reiteration of Parminder's arguments against July 18th. Right. And it's the same attack on the symbolism and the chronology that we saw by Parminder. I mean, basically, they're just reiterating his arguments. 
So, so it has to be of the same spirit. And does that still exist within this movement, even after December 6, 2020? I'd have to say yes to that. Yeah, okay. Now, uh, I'm just looking at the chat here. So, so why do you bring up the six, 46... 1,500 and the 465. I mean, we know that that's part of uh, our understanding of things. But you're bringing this up here in the chat for a reason. Okay, so this is Parminder's persecution. Okay. Now, I can't bring up the diagram, but can you remember exactly where, where we start this, Parminder's persecution? Where, where does this come from? Um, I just know that the end of the 465, wasn't it um, December 6? Right. So it ends on December 6th. So you could probably figure out where it go where it started. So if we here I, if I can find this. Um, so it started on August 29th of 2019. Right. So so we counted um 46,500 that went somewhere. I can't remember where, where that, where that was spanning. Um, but then we have the 465 days that go from Parminder's rebellion to December 6, 2020, the 465 days, right? Which is pretty profound in and of itself. I'm trying to start my other computer so I can look at these these documents. <clears throat> okay. So sometimes, you know, we could say, well, why is why is I mean, you know, Theodore having these troubles with his computer? Well, I think the reason is it's actually directed us into a, a something that we weren't really going to study out of necessity, and that's this this chapter here. So, so now we have a lion. And it's going to kill him. Yeah, so it's November 4th, 1888. That's where it is. So you have that 46,500 days. And that goes to, to August 29th, 2019? Um, I think it was the last day of the 1888 conference to yeah. the ordination of Parminder, which would okay, be February so, yeah. 27. Right, so it goes to his ordination. And then we have a 100th of that, the 465 days that, that span between the rebellion and the De December 6th declaration. Okay, so that's how it goes. And, and of course the importance there is that we can see that there's this connection between Parminder and what happened on December 6, 2020. Now, if we have this lion, um, well, who's the lion that is going to slay the disobedient prophet? So how are we going to make an application of this? Okay, so the question is, does it have to do with Trump? You know, because we have this lion that's in connection with this, with this um, donkey.
and, and we have so well, we have on the external I suppose, sorry on the external i suppose it could but i mean if you're looking at the internal we should go with that yeah i know so it's an internal but we have these symbols outside of us that affect this movement trump affects this movement islam affects this movement and in this case we could say that the ass could represent um uh something right either islam but it also can represent the democrats but in this case we have uh the disobedient prophet is killed his his ass stays there and the lion stays there so you got this ass and this lion standing by this carcass which we say is ffa Is, is is this a proper way to look at it? And how would we understand then the ass and the lion? Do they symbolize something in this movement? Does the ass uh, symbolize um, the prophecy of Islam and the lion symbolize the Trump prophecy? Is that how we should look at it? Yes, I think so. But then I was also thinking, okay, now we have a carcass. Well, the people that have gone out, out and done their own thing and followed, you know, Bryant and, and Lambert, they're yeah. spiritually dead. They've already been slain by Satan. And ultimately, if they don't repent, they're going to be slain by God. So it could be that too. Okay. But but we know this is the disobedient prophet. He's the one who gives uh, the prophecy of Josiah, which we say is July 18th. And FFA did give that message. And then he's going to ride on this, this ass, this donkey, right? It's going to be killed by a lion. And, and we can see that the lion and the ass symbolize the, tr the lion symbolizing the Trump prophecy and the ass symbolizing the Islam, uh, the July 18th prediction specifically, but dealing with Islam. So when we look at Trump and when we look at July 18th, those predictions failed on the surface. The e end of FFA occurs. But now we're going to have this prophet that had deceived him. So this is some kind of a message. And so we don't know, you know, who this prophet is. We, we've defined it here having to do with the message of Parminder. Now, Parminder would argue that I'm the disobedient prophet, that I'm the one who deceived people, though he wouldn't make that application because he wouldn't agree with anything that we're doing here in this study. But I mean, if he were to, he would have to label me as the disobedient or as the prophet that deceived FFA. And, but that wouldn't make sense in the context here of how we're understanding this. But uh, we have some prophet that is deceiving. And it says, when the prophet that brought him back from the way heard thereof, he said, it is the man of God who was disobedient unto the word of the Lord. Therefore, the Lord hath delivered him unto the lion, which he hath torn, which hath torn him and slain him according to the word of the Lord, which he spake unto him. Now, could we see, though, that this is what Parminder is saying? That FFA was disobedient. Is the prophet here putting blame upon himself? when he sees, when he hears about this? Who's he blaming? Who's being blamed here? Wouldn't it be the disobedient prophet? Um, yeah, so he's blaming FFA, isn't he? Yeah. 
The was one FAA, one. was FAA, FAA, FAA a disobedient prophet? No. But it is to the false prophet. Right. This is really getting quite complex. Okay. FFA, you say, gave the 718 cry. And then they, it seems to me that they reneged on it. So where do we go from there? Okay. Well, I wouldn't say it they reneged. They had a right at first and then they reneged on it. So they are disobedient at that point. Okay. Well, right. Would, so, well, right. well, well wouldn't, uh, wouldn't FFA be the one who's been deceived by the disobedient prophet? Yeah. FFA has been deceived and FFA is going to die. But now you have the disobedient prophet and or not the, dis, the, the prophet that did the deception. He's going to blame FFA. Right. He's not well, going to blame. That's the way I got it. He's not blaming himself, is he? No, he's not taking the blame. He's giving, he's dishing it out. He's got three fingers pointing back to himself, in other words. Right. So, so this would actually describe those who still sympathize with Parminder. Do we still have those people who look at FFA and say, well, you know, they, he got caught up in this chronology. Jeff Jeff got caught up in this chronology. Jeff isn't a socialist and he's not woke like us, so he's dead. Yeah, and of course you can throw in throw in the chron chronology too, the time yeah. setting. Yeah, yeah. So there is a mistake. Even even those there there are some people in this movement. So. There are people in this movement who agree with the December 6th declaration. They're not necessarily making themselves known to everyone, uh, but I know that they exist. And so, so we have this element that is ignoring uh, the truth. That is, they want to go back to something else. But instead of joining with those who who wrote the December 6th declaration in an open way, they attack the message uh, uh, covertly within the movement itself. And I don't know if other people have seen this or recognize it, but I believe that that's what's occurring. That is, there are people who, and they may sometimes give lip service to July 18th, and even be supportive of the idea that we can reinterpret this uh, prophecy so that we can somehow accept the, uh, you know, the idea that Trump has to be reelected in order to uh, vindicate this, this message of Trump, right? But yet when this fails, when Trump does not get reelected, where are they going to stand? You, you understand what the point that I'm trying to make? It's yes, hard to make I understand. <laughs> okay, right. So, so we're going to see this testimony. We have this this ass and this lion. That's that basically are standing by this disobedient prophet. But is the lion eating him? No, he's not. At least it's not, it doesn't say that he was. Right. So he's not. He's not, not going to eat him or the ass. Right? He's by this carcass. So he, but, and there's this ass there. And the lion stood by the carcass. So, so why is this happening? What, where, where, what is this marking? It's definitely a symbolic representation. I mean, it has all the characteristics of, of that. The, the lion not eating that carcass 
Um, maybe that's because he knows it's poison. I don't know. Well, no, that's not why. But, but, the, but ain't, the, ain't, it, ain't they both dead? Okay, so when we go here, so the, dis, so the deceptive prophet, he's going to saddle an ass, and he's going to go back to where this prophet was killed. So he went and found his carcass, carcass cast in the way, and the ass and the lion standing by the carcass. The lion had not eaten the carcass, nor torn the ass, and the prophet took up the carcass of the man of God, and laid it upon the ass, and brought it back. And the old prophet came to the city to mourn and to bury him. And he laid his carcass in his own grave, and they mourned over him, saying, Alas, my brother. And it came to pass, after he had buried him, that he spake to his son, saying, When I am dead, then bury me in the sepulchre wherein the man of God is buried. Lay my bones beside his bones. For the saying which he cried of the word of the Lord against the altar in Bethel, and against the houses of the high places which are in the cities of Samaria, shall surely come to pass. After this thing Jeroboam returned not from his evil way, but made again the lowest of the people priests. So that's just going to go back into the story of Jeroboam. So I don't know if I fully understand this story yet. I don't know if I fully understand who these people completely represent, but it, it appears that the one who had deceived the prophet, the disobedient prophet, um, is somehow still involved. So I don't know how we would take that. Any, any, okay, Jeroboam was like Micah in, I don't know what J-U-S 17 to 19 is. What's J-U-S? He had another typo on a champion of typos. It's Judges 17 to 19, because he was making priests of the lowest order, just, you know, arbitrarily seeking so-and-so that would be ad advantageous to himself it says Jeroboam did the same thing made again of the lowest of the people priests of the high places okay so yes. similar yeah so we know that Jeroboam represents uh the Sunday law the mixture of church and state as well FFA went back to Samaria to be buried after deleting the July 18 message okay that that might make sense. So so is there then a sympathy with um, Parminder's movement in some way with the death of FFA? Maybe that's the way that we would look at that. Would Parminder's movement see FFA as dead and this whole message is dead? And that those that are sympathetic uh, with Parminder, that the carcass of FFA, so to speak, has, has gone back to Samaria. Is that how we would understand it? I mean, it's pretty interesting. I guess that's one way you can look at it. I mean, this is the most convoluted, deep thing. <laughs> so many layers. Well, yeah, there's definitely layers, but, but we are meant to understand it. So, so there's something going on that we don't fully grasp. So, I mean, I, and, you know, as I said, I've looked at this, you know, in the past, 
And I was saying, well, how does this apply? I mean, you know, especially even before July 18th. I mean, I had no idea to understand this. No, no way to understand it. But we can see um, that there's this, this kind of odd way in which we look at this story. Because on the one hand, I mean, we can look at this person who deceived um, the disobedient prophet uh, still believes that this prophecy is going to be fulfilled. So, so that doesn't really make much sense in the context of, of what we're trying to understand here. But FFA is dead. So, so where does where did the deception happen specifically? You know, that's that's what I don't I don't really know how to to frame the whole thing. I think that part of it may not have been fulfilled yet, and that's part of our problem. And we don't have somebody in this movement have, having having a vision, and then all is made clear, unfortunately, at least not yet. Yeah, so may, maybe we can't even understand this yet completely. Okay, so... Yeah, so I don't, I don't have the answer that I would like. But anyway, our time is up. So we've covered a lot of things. Um, and we're going to have to come back to this tomorrow. Um, and so maybe if we give it some thought and prayer, maybe we can sort of put this into order. But um, Theodore. Yep. Um, could you could you um, take this along with um, where, you know, Zedekiah and Jeremiah, when he was talking to Jeremiah about not taking the, um, taking the um, message to the um, priest because he was afraid that they were going to hurt Zedekiah. You know, the, you know that story? I'm not sure if I know which story you're talking about. We can look at that tomorrow, maybe. Okay. Okay. Okay, well, let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the study this morning, for the way that you direct us. And um, we ask, Lord, that we can continue to understand your word, that we can study, and that you can correct us in any errors we may have in our understanding. Please be with each one, be with this movement. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.